In my opinion, the most misunderstood part of endurance performance, endurance physiology is the battle between high carb athletes and low carb athletes. We're going to break it down, unbiased, facts, science, research. It's all here. Let's get into it. Hey guys, Nick here. Welcome back to the channel. If you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button down below. Already a couple weeks into being on YouTube here and already almost at 50 subscribers. Been awesome. Thanks for some of the great positive feedback on the video so far. So yeah, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button down below. More of these videos coming soon. We're gonna get straight into it. As I said in the intro, this is probably the most misunderstood um, part of endurance performance, endurance physiology going out there and so much misinformation on the topic. The reason for this video is because I've seen a few videos pop up recently and it's a debate that's been going on from pretty much to the, in the, the modern era, if you like. 2013 is when things like keto and low carb, high fat really started becoming more and more popular again. And why I say again is because it's the second coming. We saw this happen in the 80s as well. Um, and if you have a look at some of the research, a lot of the uh, original research on keto and things like that for performance was done in the 80s, dumped for a while, and then brought back in sort of 2013. And we've seen it become a bit of a mixed feature in endurance performance and physiology over the last little while, with athletes really sitting at polar opposite ends of the spectrum typically, and there's just this arguing debate. So this video here today is all about breaking down just the facts, the science, the research, and what is actually happening. Um, I, I'm not taking either side here because I do see benefits in both approaches, and I think it's more of a case of we need to be able to merge the key components of both of them to be able to get a positive outcome in the end. And I'll explain that later on. But I just want to be very clear that all, everything I'm about to talk through is just what happens in the human body. We can't necessarily change some of these things. And I'm not here to change your philosophy or ideology. I'm not here to bash on low carb or I'm not here to bash on high carb either way. I'm just here to break down the facts because we need to talk in a manner of terms of um, fact of the matter, physiology, what is actually happening internally in our body, what can the body do, what can't it do. Um, and then we can form our opinions on, all right, what is better for you from a personal perspective versus what is the body needing from a performance perspective and make some very clear distinctions. And I think a lot of the confusion comes from just misinterpreting some of the information. So we're gonna go through it step by step and take you through. I know this is probably gonna be a bit of a long video, but please stick around to go through that process. I might even leave some tags down in the description below so you can go to each of the time points and revisit time points um, for all the key sections of this video as well. But the first thing we need to talk about is the basics of what we call respiratory exchange ratio. And why I'm starting here is because this is the ratio between carbon dioxide and oxygen um, internally in the body when we do any sort of performance, low intensity, moderate intensity, high intensity across the entire spectrum. We're always gonna have some sort of ratio of oxygen to carbon dioxide. At lower intensities, we have an RER closer to what we know as 0 0.7, 0 0.7. And 0 0.7 will be 100% fat use because the intensity is quite low. We don't actually need a lot of energy production happening at any sort of quick rate. We can sustain it for a reasonable period of time. We've got enough oxygen supply coming in that it's pretty comfortable. So typically we associate this with rest like I am now. I don't need carbs, I'm not working hard and having to produce energy really quickly. I'm here resting, I can get oxygen in nice and comfortably. I've got time to break down that, that fat source to be able to create the energy as well. Because fat oxidation is a really complex process. Fat as a whole is a giant molecule. If we take one molecule of fat, there's a lot going on and breaking it down takes a large amount of oxygen, a large amount of time. We do get a lot of energy, which is a bonus. So that's why I can sit here at the desk for hours on end. Um, even if I'm not really eating throughout the day, I can still sit here for hours on end. You can sit for a long period of time doing minimal activity because I don't need a lot of energy being produced, but I need energy sustained. So fat is a good source here. Low intensity exercise, you go out for a slow, slow run, very slow ride, things like that. Zone two, long endurance, whatever you want to call it, base case predominantly we're gonna be using a large amount of fat because again, we don't need much rapid energy production. As long as we're sitting on that steady intensity, that comfortable moderate intensity or low intensity, we're gonna be okay. On the other end of the spectrum, we have a respiratory exchange ratio of 1.0, which is the, pretty much the, the essentially the highest we can get to. You can get to things like 1.1 when CO2 really starts to get up there, that's up at VO2 max and just passed. But a one indicates that we're at 100% carbohydrates. So really anything past 1.0 is irrelevant because we're producing enough carbon dioxide that we're starting to really, we're, we're majorly using carbs as our fuel source because that's where carbon dioxide is being produced from. Break down carbohydrates, we get a couple of byproducts, we get heat, CO2, so carbon dioxide and water. When we break down more carbohydrates, we just get more of those. So we get more carbon dioxide hence why we get close to a one. When we break down fats, we don't get as much and we're not even really getting carbon dioxide anyway. So we have a much lower ratio, it's a, it's a 0.7. Anywhere in between, so something like 0.85 as an RER is gonna be 
pretty close to an even 50-50 split. Moderate to sort of getting closer to, I guess, moderate to high intensity. We're starting to move through maybe through your tempo type stuff. Um, we're getting closer to a 50-50 split. 50% fats, 50% carbs. We're starting to work, but we can sustain it either way. What I'm getting at here is REI works on a continuum between 0.7 and 1, essentially. And the higher intensity we go, the more carbs we need. The lower intensity we go, the less carbs we need, the more fat we need. Pretty simple to start. That's point one. Point two out of this, I guess, really, is that 1.0, strangely enough, or funnily enough, matches up directly with our lactate threshold. So when we get to our anaerobic threshold, lactate threshold, we see that exponential increase in, in lactate production. Things get more challenging. Lactate threshold is the same as functional threshold, things like that. That's theoretical intensity we can sustain for about 45 to 60 minutes, depending on our training history status, etc. Once we get to threshold, our RER is 1.0. So we are 100% using carbohydrates at that point. So my first practical application of what we know about physiology is that if you want to work at or above threshold, basically meaning if you're an athlete that needs to perform in an event an hour or less in duration, you need carbs. End of story, full stop. We can end the video there if we're just talking about athletes under 60 minutes in duration for their event. Why is that the case? Because we need to work hard. There's no point you going and doing a 60 minute event and if you're an Olympic uh, 10,000 meter runner and you're running it, 27 minutes for a 10k or 28 minutes for a 10k something ridiculously fast like that there is no possible way you can get to that speed without having to use carbohydrates because you have to produce a lot of fast contractions do it quickly you just need fuel like this oxygen comes in it breaks down fuel we're gone we're also not really concerned about the fatiguing aspect so a bit of an anaerobic contribution is not going to hurt us as much in an event up to sort of 60 minutes yeah it is going to pinch towards the end it's going to be difficult but compared to something that's going to last four five ten hours the anaerobic side of things can play a little bit more of a role to get those higher speeds, those higher velocities happening. Because at the end of the day, endurance performance is all about, we start at a start line, we finish at a finish line very simply, but we need to get there in the fastest possible time to be able to beat our competitors. Or it's a duration-based event, in which case we need to cover the most ground in the, in the allocated period of time, of which we now need to hold the highest possible pace to beat all of our competitors. So for anything 60 minutes and under, carbs are king, that's basically the end of it from that perspective. When we talk about RER, the easy way to look at it is as a percentage of VO2 max. So as I said before, 1.0 RER, where we're 100% carbs and anything above that intensity, is typically happening at lactate threshold, which for most people is going to be anywhere between sort of really 85 to 90% of their VO2 max in well-trained populations, probably close to sort of 75, 80% in not very not very trained or, or very amateur, very new to endurance performance. Um, so when we are when we are looking at uh, where everything sits, 1.0 happens about 85, 90% of VO2 max. Typically about the 60%, 55 to 60% of VO2 max is where the 0 0.7 is occurring. So that's really a, a very low intensity. 50% 50, 50 of VO2 max or, or 50, 56% of VO2 max to be specific is what's considered active recovery by the American College of Sports Medicine, anything less than 56% of VO2 max. So there's only a very small band in more so trained athletes that can actually use fats from a performance aspect or an endurance aspect, as opposed to just like a recovery intensity. Um, still can use a bit. And there's only really been one study. And when we talk about and when people talk about fat adap adaptation and using more fat per minute and, and grams per minute, there's only really been one clear study in the, in the last little while showing an improvement in fat use, utilization of fat oxidation up to about 1.5 grams per minute of fat, which is a pretty high rate of fat, fat burn. That's, that's doing reasonably well, and that's the highest we can, we can probably get to, and it's the highest we've sort of seen. That came after, I preface this with, that came after two years worth of low-carb, high-fat adaptation. That only pushed up that 0.7 RER up to about 70% of VO2 max. So we're still talking very low intensities overall. What we now have to consider is that as we get fitter, everything shifts relative to VO2 max. So basically what we've done is we haven't necessarily changed anything from an RER perspective or, or utilization of fuels. We've just moved the whole engine up. So it's just as effective and efficient as before. And this is where metabolic efficiency comes in, usage of fats and carbs to be able to change chemical energy into mechanical work is that we haven't necessarily become any more efficient 
we're just better overall. So it's just all scaled up in relation to where our engine is. And that's a critical part that we need to consider is that yes, we can get up to 70% of our VO2 max. That's only gonna make an improvement to our performance if we can hold a reasonably high pace for 70%. So we look at pro professional athletes and if I take a really high level triathlete, for example, professional Ironman, their 70% of VO2 max is an incredible speed. Um, they've got incredible engines, so they can't afford to sit on that high intensity. And that's why they get a fast race result at and some of those athletes can be a bit of this low carb, high fat is because they're actually sitting on quite a low percentage of their top end engine. Um, but they can, and they, because they're doing it at a speed that is a lot faster than the average person, they're obviously going to end up with a fast race result. So we can't get confused or, or caught up with, well, this professional athlete goes out and he does an eight hour Ironman and he's a low carb, high fat athlete. Um, well, yeah, maybe he is and he can do an eight-hour Ironman. doesn't mean the average age grouper who's doing a 12-hour Ironman can get down to a nine-hour Ironman because of low-carb, high-fat if that, that, that amateur athlete is working at 75, 80% of the VO2 max. I mean, as we've seen, the highest we've seen in the research is 70% of VO2 max is the, the utmost for maximum fat utilization. It's the type of thing that, like, it, it, it's not, we're not looking at it in the right way. We're just taking parts of information and go, mashing it all together and going, yeah, it's the way to go. And I'm not bashing low, low carb, high fat by any means by saying this. It's just what the objective truth is through the research. So we'll move on from, we'll move on from that now in terms of what, what is some of the research saying from an endurance athlete perspective, what do we need to do to be able to be effective and win races and, and things like that? And what is the way to go? All right, so there was a lot of research done and I'm gonna reference a, a lot of the work done by Louise Burke, who, Burke here, who is an AIS dietitian nutritionist. She's been there for 20, 25 years. One of the leading dietitian nutritionists in terms of research and, and practically applied space in high performance sport um, around the world, let alone Australia. So what she did, and she's had a big emphasis on basically looking at what is low carb, high fat, and cops a lot of flack for some of the research she, that she does purely because of what I said before between this just back and forth argument between both sides of the spectrum. And she's just going into the research and I was lucky enough to listen to a presentation of hers earlier in the year as part of my master's is that she's just going into the research going, well, what are the facts of the matter? Let's test your hypothesis and either prove it correct or prove it wrong because that's how science works. It's a very simple process, but at the end of the day, I think a lot of that just gets mix, missed with just this argue, argument back and forth. Um, so a lot of her studies, interestingly enough, were done on race walkers. And I find that a really I interesting population to use because what we commonly associate with race walking is, oh, that's low intensity performance, right? But for those athletes that are at Olympic level, they're working quite hard. They're using quite, they're working at quite a high percentage of their VO2 max. They're still working hard. I mean, it's, it's just a different technique like they're, they're still moving if you look at a professional race walker and you can see them uh, live or you wa watching them on tv probably doesn't do enough justice but you if you see them live they're moving um they're, they're moving a pretty solid pace and they're putting out some pretty good time so we have to consider that they they're racing at the end of the day so they need to put out a high uh, a high pace output or a high intensity to be able to win and be successful for prize money gold medals at the olympics whatever it may be so a lot of her research on, on high carb versus low carb has been done on race walkers for the reason that, I mean, compared to runners, it is going to be a, rel a, a lower intensity overall. I mean, someone walking who's restricted by a technique inhibition is going to be inhibited by the fact that they can't run. Um, running is obviously going to push more in the favor of probably high carb because we're working at a high percentage of VO2 max, whether that's 80% of VO2 max versus the walkers might only be able to get up to maybe 70%. I don't know the exact numbers, but there is going to be some clear difference. You can make that connection straight away. And a marathon runner is obviously going to cover 42 Ks faster than a marathon race walker. Makes sense. Um, but what some of her research went into is they compared low carb versus high carb, did all the adaptation um, protocols, had a look at what their performances were like, and over 10,000 meters, which is longer for a race walker than 60 minutes and, uh, of, from, from that perspective, over the 10,000 meter duration, they saw that high carb athletes improve their performance over three to four week periods of adaptation to the diet. Low carb athletes reduced performance. So performance got worse over that period by about 1%. High carb athletes got better by about um, sort of 7%. Low carb got worse by about 1%. So almost not, not really changed too much from performance perspective. Both groups improved VO2 max by about the same margin. So overall, the training side of things was improving. Things were going up. 
but we've got this interesting uh, interesting period where we've got high carb athletes outperforming their previous results and low carb athletes not really doing much from a performance perspective. This is 10,000 meters. When we then extrapolate it out and have a look at what their, um, their 20K times were like and normalize times using different normalizing techniques to then standardize it for different conditions. Obviously they tested over multiple years and they repeated this study a few times um, consecutive years to be able to make sure they've got enough data to say, yes, we are seeing clear um, clear difference between the two diets and, and which may be providing a performance benefit or not. They saw the same thing again and again and again and they actually saw in 20K um, race performance, they saw a very similar thing, not as much of an extent, but they still saw the high carb athletes outperforming significantly the low carb athletes when they did standardize the results to conditions. And it, if they were uh, obviously 10,000s done on a track, 20Ks done on the road from a race walking perspective, if they were able to hold that same track pace on the road, high carb athletes would be absolutely dominating the low carb athletes every single time. So it's an interesting study because then. I look at it and go, all right, well, if runners are going at a probably higher percentage of VO2 max because they can, because they can run, and it's it's probably even more economical, things like that, they're not being restricted by a technique as such. We obviously want to lean to the carbohydrate side of things because that's probably going to improve our performance. And it's where we see a lot of it um, happening is actually in the running. The running space is low low carb is inhibiting performance we're getting significantly worse race results as opposed to the high carb populations mostly due to and this comes down to i guess practical application number two that you can take away from this is it mostly comes down to the economy of performance and the fact that using more fat for fuel has a higher oxygen cost so fat is a bigger molecule than, than glucose or carbohydrate therefore it requires more oxygen to break down and it takes more time we already mentioned that at the start if we're then trying to get more oxygen to break down that that fat, if we're running at the same intensity, if I have two athletes running at four minute K pace, but athlete A is using a lot more carbs, athlete B is using a lot more fats, you might think in your head, well, if athlete B is using a lot more fats, it might take them longer than hit the wall. Probably. But athlete B probably also has a higher oxygen consumption for that same pace. So what does that mean? It's a higher oxygen cost. It's less economical. It's less. Um, it's much more difficult to sustain then because we have to work a lot harder from a respiratory and cardiovascular perspective to get the oxygen to the mitochondria, to the muscle to break down that fat as well compared to the carbohydrate athlete who doesn't have to work through that process as much. Um, they're not under that sort of physiological stress as much. Yes, we're using a little bit more carbs, so we may may risk hitting the wall a bit sooner, but in events where if we, if we assume each was equal from a fueling strategy and, and you're able to manage that, something like a marathon, we're not really going to see an athlete hit the wall unless you're running for three, three and a half hours and you're going well above the intensity you should be running. Most of the time we see damage to performance from high carb athletes is gastrointestinal upset and typically from just blowing themselves up and overexerting too early or a hydration thing if it's um, extreme heat, things like that. So really what we're getting here is we're reducing our economy because we're using more fat because we have a higher oxygen cost. And the last, the last thing we want to do, and if you go back to a video, I might link it above here, is the, the factors, the three key factors in influencing endurance performance. Running economy plays a massive role, and a lot of that has to do with the auction cost of, or what is the auction cost of our, of our movement, essentially. If we've got really high auction consumption for the same pace, and we've lifted our auction consumption for the same pace again, there's no improvement to performance. We're running at the same pace. So why not do it the easier and more economical way? So we've known this for years and years and years. Every physiological study has shown that fat requires more oxygen than carbohydrates and you are going to have an increased oxygen cost. Therefore, economy is reduced. So practical takeaway two, reduction of running economy and re reduction of movement economy overall by using more fats isn't a good thing for performance because it's going to make that same pace less sustainable rather than more sustainable. So whether you want to talk about hitting the wall or not, it's probably going to damage you more so than if you just worked off carbs and eventually somehow hit the wall. Some athletes do improve. And some of the research that Louise Burke has done with these race walkers is, well, we did the low carb and we actually saw improvements to performance. Well, why, why is that the case? Not all athletes had a fail. Some of them actually succeeded with this strategy. And we've seen it time and time again. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence of athletes going on the low carb diets um, and having improved race results. So we do need to look at that from a practical sense and go, okay, is there some benefit to doing a low carb? I've already talked a lot about maybe high carb is better in certain circumstances, particularly for high intensity, but where might low carb be, be more beneficial? And typically where we've seen it for the most part, if we talk amateur non-elite athletes first, we typically see 
there's a big influence on running economy in particular that counterbalances that oxygen cost I just talked about when we have a reduction in body weight. Um, if you're 70 kilos and then you lose five kilos and you're 65, but you can put it out the same pace, of course it's gonna be much easier to run at that, that same pace at a lighter weight. Makes sense, there's so much less stress on the body from a loading perspective and forces through the ground. Gravity has less of an impact, it's easy to overcome, 65 kilos and it is 70. Makes sense. So where we see a lot of the performance improvement is actually from a weight loss perspective using a low carb, high fat approach. So for the amateur athlete, the age group athlete, that might be a viable option for you if it makes a lot of sense. Where we don't see the performance improvement is well-trained athletes who don't have much much weight to lose or if any weight to lose at all. And then they're trying to do reasonably high intensity activity, anything, like I said before, above sort of 70% VO2 max is probably the upper end, which is most people in a sprint, Olympic 70.3 triathlon, probably your top end age group and an Ironman is probably working about 70% VO2 max, so maybe 75, depending on their training status. Um, half marathon, marathon, most road races from a cycling perspective, um, and then any crit races, time trials are going to be less than 60 minutes typically. So really what I've done is I've just covered off most endurance events that the typical audience that I'm, I'm sure are listening to this are probably doing, and it's the type of thing that we then look at it and go, all right, if you've got some weight to lose and it's going to be beneficial, low carb might be a way to go. If I'm trying to work at high intensity, maybe not. If we're looking at something like ultra endurance, so we talk about like a hundred mile race, for example, maybe there's a bit of bit there. And this is where some of the research is actually positive for a low carb approach and where we see a lot of this, oh, but low carb is really good for endurance performance and it's the next big thing, blah, 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 blah. And where most of the discussion comes from is from ultra athletes. And yes, it might be useful for ultra athletes. What we then have to consider though, is if you're doing a hundred mile, you're probably not working at 70% of VO2 max, you might be working closer to 65, 60% of VO2 max, which is now getting close to that 0.7 anyway, where we've got a high amount of fat use regardless in that event because the intensity is down. Um, the really elite guys, if we then come back to the example of, oh, but what about that elite hundred miler who goes really, really fast over that period? Well, yeah, but their endurance overall and their VO2 max and their, their overall aerobic engine is probably massive you have to then consider how much training they've done to be able to get to that point. They're also running at a much faster pace than what the typical person is. But again, it's relative percentages of their physiology. They're still sitting at 60, 65% of their VO2 max, but their 65% is a hell of a lot faster than the average person's 65%. So if you're working at a sustained pace at 65% of VO2 max or less, you're probably going to be okay. And low carb might actually be really beneficial there because it is going to, anytime we get carbs into the system, it is going to spike our insulin and spike that carb burning effect and we're going to burn through carbs a lot quicker when we do have that that jump in, in carbohydrate or, or glucose coming into the blood and the, the body senses that. It wants to use it. Um, so maybe suppressing that a little bit is going to be beneficial for ultra distance events where we are working at very low intensity. Um, but we're now talking about a very different scenario compared to a marathon runner. And we can't just blindly apply the same principles for one across the other. We have to look at the unique circumstance, the intensity relative to that person's overall engine that they're working at, the duration they're gonna be working at it for, um, that's then probably gonna dictate where we go from a high carb or low carb approach. Some of the research is starting to head into, well, maybe we can do some periodized approaches as well. And this is another thing, and I'm probably gonna throw this up as I guess practical application three to take away from today's video is, the cycling through a low carb into high carb approach throughout the annual training cycle. So there's inevitably periods of the year and now is a perfect one where a lot of athletes don't have much racing. Um, they don't have much specific preparation to do because things have all changed with the, the current circumstances. A lot are gonna be going out and just working on their base aerobic, maybe doing some maintenance of some high intensity. We're not really worried about performing optimally. You don't need to be at optimal performance in a lockdown period when you can't race. Um, unless you're doing some sort of virtual racing, maybe a different story. But if you're not racing at all, you don't need to be at optimal high intensity performance. Doing some high intensity is going to maintain some of your adaptations um, and maintain your overall physiology and your aerobic performance. But it's not like we're gonna to have to race for, for any extended period of time. Uh, and we, we don't necessarily need to be working there for long periods of time. We're just doing it for a maintenance aspect. So if we're doing a lot of long slow and it doesn't really matter, maybe it's the time to work on a, a low carb strategy for now because the body just doesn't really need it. And a trap that a lot of will probably fall into at the moment is if you're sitting a lot at home, you're just going out and training, what we're forgetting is we're taking out, all right, you had to walk to the train station to get to work or you had to walk from the car park to get into work. You're walking around the office all day. Maybe at home you're not as, as just generally active as you are. Um, 
typically during your day, there's not other things going on. Maybe you're doing some more swimming, pools are shut, obviously. So there's there's all these factors where you may not actually need those additional carbs at the moment. So a low carb approach might be the way to go for now. I'm not saying it definitely is, but it might be an option to look at now because that high intensity requirement just isn't there. But when we get back into racing and, and racing, we know isn't just one intensity. It's something I haven't touched on yet is that endurance racing isn't just you set out at four minute Ks at the start and you end at four minute Ks um, typically. Some athletes will go and do that, but the athletes who are at the top end of the field, and if you're racing competitively, typically you're pacing off each other. There's surges. You're trying to be tactical about your racing. Um, if you lose the you lose the wheel in a, in a crit race, you got to hammer it to get back on the wheel because everyone else behind you is probably going to crack it. But at the same time, you need to keep up with the others. So you need to work hard and have these intermittent bursts of, en- uh, bursts of energy coming through or bursts of high, high intensity happening throughout. It's... You look at any power profile over the course of most races from a from a cycling perspective over long long races, road races, Ironman, etc. You see cruising, 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 spike for a couple of minutes to catch a wheel, cruising, 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 spike again. We see the same in running. From a from a high intensity perspective, there are these ups and downs. So we need the carbs for those moments. Um, we also need the carbs to sustain that that average output. But when those moments go even higher, we need it there. If we're trying to pick up towards the end, we're going to need carbs to do that ultra endurance may be a different story. There's going to be bigger time gaps between athletes. You're out there for 100 miles, for example. So you, you're probably going to want to sit on a very consistent intensity and not play around with the intensity too much. So my last takeaway is is really, you, you we need to be focused on what is the outcome of the event? What are we actually required to do and what is happening? That's going to dictate our fueling strategy, whether we go more of a high carb or low carb approach. But like I said, when the high intensity efforts aren't as um, aren't as critical in the part of the training or a critical part of the cycle. If it's not, uh, if you're doing a six month period where you're not really training for anything, maybe low carb is the way to go because there are some good health benefits in terms of not putting on weight or even reducing weight if that's important to you. But it's the type of thing that from a performance aspect, we just need to be careful on how we look at these approaches because it can be quite harmful to your performance in some regards, but it can also be beneficial depending which way you go in your individual circumstances. Overall, in summary, I'm going to leave you with this. Basically, break down your event. What is specific to you first? Do you need to be working at high intensity? Yes or no? Do you need to be at a sustained intensity or are there intermittent bursts of, bursts of uh, higher intensity periods throughout? If there's intermittent bursts or you have to work at a reasonably high intensity, 70%, 65% of VO2 max and above, carbs are the way to go still, regardless. Carbs are the way to go. You're obviously going to have to fuel throughout, but that's any race that goes for a long period of time. You're going to have to refuel. Six, less than 65% of VO2 max, ultra endurance, consistent intensity, no no spikes up and down. Low carb might be the way to go there. There There is a there is enough scope to go either way. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but in certain circumstances, we clearly see that some are, uh, that high carb is better than low carb. In some other circumstances, like ultras, we see low carb might be a little bit better than high carb. It's just the way it is, like I said from the start. We're talking facts, we're talking science, we're talking research. This is just an objective view, or an outsider's view. I don't have any biases. I'm not linked to any um, cookbooks or, or methodologies behind this. I just look at it from what it is, from what the body can do and how we can optimize performance but at either side in the appropriate circumstance and get a positive, positive outcome. So I'm going to leave it there because I know this video is already long enough and thanks for staying around this far if you already have. I'm going to leave uh, the opportunity to ask any questions down in the comments because I think there's a lot we can talk about here and there's a lot of variations of, of what we can talk about for specific uh, circumstances. So if you do have a very specific question, please leave it in the comments below. If you haven't already, hit the subscribe button so you can keep up to date with the rest of the content coming up on the channel. I'm exhausted. I hope you're not listening to all of that. I know it is a long one. I apologize for that, but there is a lot we can talk about. I'm probably going to have a few more videos on this in the future, touching on some progressions and things as we go. So hopefully you enjoyed today's video and we'll see you in the next one. Bye.